If you were to put a theme behind James chapter 4, it would have to be loving the world versus loving God. In many different ways in this small chapter, James gives us uh, some rebukings to those who love the world and love uh, love the things of the world versus those who love God and the blessings that come to them. The chapter begins right where chapter 3 left off. At the end of chapter 3, in verse 18 of that chapter, James said that the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace to them that make peace. And then in the next chapter, the verse continues with that thought by looking at the opposite of that, the opposite of peace being war, where he asks the question, from whence comes wars and fightings among you? Even of your lust that war in your members, the, the, the location, the place where wars come from, come from an, an attitude of lusting uh, and the, the attitude of wanting to get what's mine and taking from you to have it for myself. That hostile, uh, lacking in peace kind of attitude uh, has no place in Christianity, and yet it happens even among Christians, and that's what James is talking about. Righteousness leads to peace, and so we should not be um, trying to have war with one another. Verse 2, he says, You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have, and you cannot obtain. <clears throat> you fight and you war and you have not because you ask not. You don't even bother asking God for the things that you need or want in this life. You just try to take by force. Uh, instead of relying on God, you take matters into your own hands, and thus these wars, uh, in a manner of speaking, pop up. But then he ended that verse by saying, yeah, you receive not because you ask not. That leads him into the next statement in verse 3. You ask and receive not. Even when you do ask, you don't receive. Because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. In other words, when you do ask God for things, you're asking Him for things that you want that are not necessary for your life, that you, that you lust after. And so you have the, the gumption to ask God for those things that you lust after. Well, He's not going to give you those things because you're asking amiss. You're asking Him, the very uh, notion of your asking, I mean, uh, is improper because you're asking for things you shouldn't have. <clears throat> Verse 4, and why are they asking for those things? Because they love those things more than they love God. The world they love more than God. And that leads him to say in verse 4, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. You want all of these things of the world because you love the world, and that makes you the friend of the world. Well, if you're the friend of the world, then you are the enemy of God, and you cannot be both friend of God and the world. Verse 5, Speaking of lusting and envying and desiring, he says, do you think that the scripture says in vain, and this is a paraphrase of Genesis 6 verse 5, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy. In Genesis 6 5, God looked down at the state of humanity and saw that it was a population that loved to lust and just desired to have sinful things. And James says that scripture was not written in vain. People who have that attitude are looked down, uh, looked down on by God in an unfavorable light. <clears throat> they lust to envy and they desire to have things. And that is not the way God's children should behave. Verse 6, but he gives more grace, God does. To whom? James adds, he, uh, wherefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you are prideful, if you are conceited, arrogant, boastful, uh, and that's all of the attitudes that are present when you are asking God for things that you lust after, then God will resist you because he resists the proud. But if you are humble, if you lower yourself, if you um, uh, abase yourself before God and debase yourself before God, then he will give grace to the humble. And that's Proverbs 3.34, among other passages. Verse 7, James says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Your lusting and desire to have things of the world is just playing right into the hands of the devil. If you humble yourself, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? You draw near to God. Verse 8, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. That is to say, stop your sinful actions. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cleanse your sinful thoughts. Purify your sinful thoughts. Uh, Double-minded. to Try to love God and the world. You can't do that. You must love God only. 
And that leads to the uh, attitude of repentance, which is discussed in verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn. Afflicted, meaning uh, to have great pain. You should feel sorry over your sin. And mourn, you should have grief over your sin. Let your laughter, your joy in your sinning, be turned to mourning, your sorrow in that you've sinned. And your joy, your happiness in your sinful state, should change over to heaviness, a feeling of sorrow over your sin. All of that leads to godly repentance, or godly sorrow, rather, leads to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. <clears throat> and all of that is in the context of approaching God, which leads him to say in verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. If you humble yourselves before God, He'll lift you up. If you are prideful and try to lift yourself up to God, He will humble you. You don't want to be humbled by God. You want to humble yourself, and God will lift you up. You want to be lifted by God. Verse 11. Speak not evil of one another. Literally, the, the phrase is, stop speaking evil of one another. This is something they had been doing, which is probably causing the wars and the fightings earlier described. <clears throat> so speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. Why? Because when you judge another and you speak evil of another, you are rendering a verdict against that brother. You are taking the place of the law and you are putting yourself in the position of judge over the law. So you're saying you don't need the law and thus you are attacking the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And that puts yourself in the place of God. And God is the only judge that judges us by the law. There is one lawgiver, verse 12, who is able to save to render us not guilty and destroy to render us uh, guilty. Who are you that judges another? You're not God, so you should not be judging your brothers or your sisters. Verse 13, presumption is this sin mentioned here. Go to now. You that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. You have this presumptuous attitude that all of your life's plans are all made up and all worked out. And you know exactly what you're going to do. Tomorrow you're going to go to the city. You're going to buy and sell. You're going to make some money. You have all of your plans, but you've left God out of them. That presumption is the sin here. Whereas you know not what will be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You could die tonight, and thus you'll never go to the city tomorrow. Your life is a vapor. It's here for a little while and then vanishes away. It's like a, a mist, a fog that quickly dissipates as the day lingers on. Your life is over before you know it. So when you make your plans, don't leave God out of them. Notice verse 15. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Notice that James is not condemning having plans. He is condemning when you leave God out of your plans. Have your plans. Make up your plans. That's, that is a prudent thing to do. That's being a good steward of your life that God has given you, is to plan what you're going to do. But remember, it is God's will what you will do. Leave God into your plans. Don't leave Him out. Or put God into your plans. Don't leave Him out. Verse 16. But now you rejoice in your boastings. Oh, I'm going to do all of these things. And you boast and you rejoice in your boastings. And James says, all such rejoicing is evil. Uh, it's evil because you are uh, putting yourself in the place of God, thinking you can control your life's plans. You're supposed to be children of God, following His leadership. Don't forget that. And that ends in verse 17 with Him saying, Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. And the doing good in this context is putting God in your life's plans. You know to do that as a child of God. If you don't do it, if you leave God out, then you are a sinner uh, in your life. You're making these plans, and your plans may be good, they may be benign, but they become evil because you have left God out of them. So don't leave God out of your plans. And that's how this short, uh, very um, compacted chapter of James ends, with an exhortation for us to be mindful of our lives and to put God first in our plans. We'll pick up with James chapter 5 and we'll end our study of the book of James next time. Until then, thank you very much.